Good morning. Good morning. Just a few quick announcements before we begin our service. As you can see, Megan is not with us today. Megan tested positive for COVID on Wednesday, and so we will be including her uh, in our prayers of the church as she recovers. But we are delighted to have Kathy Rabine with us this morning. And special thanks to Kevin Bonin for helping to arrange that. And as soon as I heard your name, I knew we would be in good hands. Because uh, with a last name like Rabine, how could we not be? So thank you so much to Kathy. We even get two for the price of one. So we welcome George as well. Well, if you were with us last Sunday, we began a fall sermon series for the rest of this month. And then carrying into October, our epistle lessons are from Paul's letters to Timothy. And so today we continue our look at 1 Timothy and what Paul had to say to his most trusted co-worker and to the believers in Ephesus. With that, I invite you to rise as we begin our worship. And as always, we do so with our invocation. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart, and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching Him in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave me to I invite you to kneel as your people. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your church in your perpetual mercy, and because without you we cannot but fall, preserve us from all things hurtful, and lead us to all things profitable to our salvation. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the book of Amos, chapter 8. Hear this, you that trample on the needy and bring to ruin the poor of the land, saying, when will the new moon be over so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath so that we may offer wheat for sale? So we will make the ephah small and the shekel great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and the needy for a pair of sandals and selling the sweepings of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob, surely I will never forget any of their deeds. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Give praise, you servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Let the name of the Lord be blessed from this time forth forever. From the rising of the sun to its going down, let the name of the Lord be praised. The Lord, the Lord is high above all nations, God's glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God, who sits in throne on high? But, but stoops to behold the heavens and the earth. The Lord takes up the weak out of the dust and lifts up the poor from the ashes. And throwing down with the rulers, with the rulers of the people. The Lord makes the woman of a childless house to be a joyful mother of children. Hallelujah. And our second reading comes from 1 Timothy. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. 
For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Jesus Christ, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to Luke, the 16th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Then Jesus said to the disciples, There was a rich man who had a manager, and charges were brought to him that this man was squandering his property. So he summoned him and said to him, What is this that I hear about you? Give me an accounting of your management, because you cannot be my manager any longer. And the manager said to himself, What will I do now that my master is taking the position away from me? I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I have decided what to do so that when I am dismissed as manager, people may welcome me into their homes. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he asked the first, How much do you owe my master? He answered, A hundred jugs of olive oil. He said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it fifty. Then he asked another, How much do you owe? He replied, A hundred containers of wheat. He said to him, Take your bill, and make it eighty. And his master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the children of this age are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than are the children of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourselves by means of dishonest wealth, so that when it's gone, they may welcome you into the eternal homes. Whoever is faithful in a very little is faithful also in much, and whoever is dishonest in a very little is dishonest also in much. If then you have not been faithful with the dishonest wealth, who will entrust you the true riches? And if you have not been faithful with what belongs to another, who will give you what is your own? No slave can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Well, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. For years now, maybe as many as three decades, I've used a prayer list during our end of the evening devotions. Elaine and I, we started out this custom quite early in our marriage. And many of you here today, or many of you worshiping at home, at one time or another, have most likely been on our prayer list. But I have a confession to make. I wish, I wish that I could stand before you and say that I started the prayer list because I'm such a godly man. But that wouldn't be honest. Because, you see, I began to use a prayer list out of shame. I began to use it out of embarrassment. I began 
a prayer list out of regret. Let me explain. Years ago, I would tell people that I would pray for them, and then the next time I saw them, I would be ashamed because I realized internally I hadn't kept my word. And after this happened more than once, I was convicted to change my ways. And as a result, the next time I told someone that I would be praying for them, I quickly found a pen and a piece of paper and jotted down their name so that I wouldn't forget. Well, let's get personal. Let's continue to be personal for a moment. What about you? Do you have a prayer list? And if so, who is on your prayer list? And maybe that should lead to another question. Who should, who should be on our prayer list this week, the rest of this month, the rest of this year? And does the Bible have anything at all to say about who should be on our prayer list? And this leads then to our sermon text. As I mentioned even before our service began, our epistle lessons for the rest of September and through almost all of October come from Paul's two letters to Timothy. And I'll be using these assigned readings this month and next as the basis for my messages to you. And so today's reading begins with this admonition written from the pen of the Apostle Paul. I urge then, first of all, that request, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in positions of authority. And that that brings to mind something that took place here, here in this very sanctuary early last week. For a few months now, on one Tuesday evening every month, a few of us have met here in this holy place, in this very sanctuary. We've started a ministry earlier this year called Prayer Partners. And we meet and we pray, but we don't have any set agenda. I guess you could say that we simply let the Holy Spirit lead us to pray. Now for the past two times that we've met, I've started off our hour by reading from Richard Foster's book simply entitled Prayer. And in it, Foster, a Quaker pastor and writer, he devotes 21 chapters to talking about different kinds of prayer, 21 different kinds of prayer. Well, did you catch it? In our sermon text for today, Paul mentions four specific types of prayer. First, request. Second, simply prayer. Third, intercession. And fourth, thanksgiving. But Paul, he doesn't stop there by talking about the different kinds of prayers that Christians can offer. He goes on to spell out who should be on our prayer list. He mentions everyone, and then he adds kings and all those who are in authority. You see, when you get down to it, Christian prayer has no bounds. We can literally pray for anyone and everyone. And Paul, he gives a very, very specific reason why, why Timothy and the Ephesian believers should pray for kings and for those in authority. It was for their own benefit so that they could live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. Well, I don't know about you, but these days, peace and quiet, that suits me just fine. I'm very comfortable, very satisfied with a quiet and a peaceful life. But I can't help but wonder about why, why Paul wrote this specifically to Timothy and to the Ephesians. And I can't help but wonder if he wasn't thinking about the day that all hell broke loose there in Ephesus. You see, during the three years that Paul served, that he ministered in Ephesus, many came to faith 
as a result of his preaching and his teaching. And in Acts chapter 19, we also read that God did a number of extraordinary miracles through the apostle. And when Paul's opponents tried to copy one of these, when they tried to cast out a demon, an evil spirit, that evil spirit gave the seven sons of Sceva such a beating that they ran out of the house bleeding and naked. And then Luke goes on to share what happened next. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. And many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls, and they burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of those scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Well, that's the equivalent of one million dollars. Imagine, imagine such a day. Now, there was a silversmith in Ephesus by the name of Demetrius, and we, when he heard or perhaps even saw what was taking place, Oh, he was angry. He had had it up to here with Paul and his ilk. He and his fellow craftsmen, you see, they made a very good living as silversmiths. They sold idols to the pagan goddess, to pilgrims who had come there to their city to worship at the temple of Artemis. And they were concerned. They were losing money because of Paul and his preaching and his teaching. And so Demetrius, he stirred up a crowd that day. And that crowd was so large that they came that close, that close to starting a riot. And if there's one thing that the Roman authorities would not tolerate anywhere in their empire, it was a riot. It was a breakdown of law and order. And that, that leads us back to our sermon text. Why would Paul urge Timothy and the Ephesian Christians to pray specifically for the king and for those in authority? It's because of this. It's because when you get right down to it, Christianity is a subversive movement. Let me repeat this. Christianity is a very deeply subversive movement. Remember the approach that the chief priests and the other religious leaders of Jesus' day used to force Pilate's hand. They told Pilate, the Roman governor, that Jesus was called a king, the king of the Jews. Oh, and then they quickly added, but we have no king but Caesar himself. Well, little did that, those religious leaders, little, little did those chief priests know that Jesus indeed is a king and he's not just the king of the Jews he's the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords to whom all under authority must answer and even bow and as a result think of this for the Christian our ultimate allegiance is not to any flag and it's not to any earthly throne our allegiance is to the God who was crucified wearing a crown of thorns. And he died on a Roman cross for the sins of the world. Let's also keep in mind that our ultimate citizenship isn't in any nation or any state. Our permanent citizenship is in the kingdom of heaven. And here and now, you and I and all believers, all the baptized, were aliens and strangers to use the verbiage of Hebrews 11. And we long for the kingdom of God to come into all its fullness. And that puts us at odds with any other power on earth. That makes the church a threat, a very real threat to all other powers on earth. Now why is this? How can this be so? Because the Christian cannot proclaim that Caesar is Lord. The first Christians, they simply would not do so. 
the first confession of the church was Jesus is Lord, and when push comes to shove, the Christian must obey God and not man or any of his laws when they're in conflict. So Paul, Paul had two very practical reasons for urging Timothy and the Ephesian Christians to pray for the king and for those who were in authority. One reason was to protect them from the accusation that they were enemies of the state. For the first few centuries of the church, Christians were considered enemies of the state. And the second reason was so that the gospel might be freely proclaimed without hindrance. So keeping all of this in mind, listen again to the beginning of our sermon text. I urge, Paul writes, I urge first of all that requests, prayers, petitions, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and dignity. And this is good, and it pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So as followers of Christ, as much as it depends on you and me, we are called to lead quiet and peaceful lives. We're called to live as law-abiding citizens of the nation, the state, and the city where we reside. But we also can't forget that at the very same time, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. And what does this mean? It means that increasingly, Christians should stand out like the proverbial sore thumb, especially in this present evil age. As we live by the word of God, even when it conflicts with the laws of our land. So let's return to that word of God and to our sermon text for this morning because Paul has something very, very important to say. He declares, God desires all, all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. The Apostle Paul was literally compelled by the love of Christ to proclaim the gospel truth both near and far. And 2,000 later, the message of the church remains the same. There is only one God, and there is only one mediator between God and humanity. And that one and only mediator is Jesus the Christ. And he gave himself as a payment to rescue all people, including you and me, including our family members, including our neighbors, and even including our enemies. And the challenge, the challenge today for the church is the same challenge that the early Christians faced. What is that challenge? How do we respond to a culture where Christians are fast becoming a minority? Did you catch the news this past week? It's estimated by scholars that by 2070, and it may be much sooner than that, Christians will be a minority in America. The number of percentage of active Christians in the country isn't just dropping, it's plummeting. And how do we live peacefully and also faithfully in a society that is filled with such religious diversity? And then finally, how do we lead godly and dignified lives in the crooked and depraved generation in which we find ourselves right now? In order to meet these challenges, we have to begin and then end with the word of God. And in all matters, because for the Christian there's nothing secular, all of life is sacred, our consciences are to be captive to the word of God. And we cannot, we must not compromise on the first commandment. We must not do so, even though the powers that be, you know, the secular authorities, they want us to believe that all religions are the same. But the God of Muhammad is not 
the same God as the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And a practicing Muslim would surely nod his head in agreement with that statement. And we must honestly and lovingly preach Christ crucified as the one and only Savior from sin and from Satan and from death. But we must also be on guard. We must be on guard against false teachers in the church, as Paul's letters to Timothy make crystal clear, because false teachers have plagued the church in each and every day and age. Satan doesn't always attack us from the outside. He frequently does so from the end. And there are men and women who would twist, distort, or even deny the word of the Lord. So, if you haven't already realized, living by faith, it ain't easy, is it these to, isn't it these days? And we shouldn't expect it to be so for the rest of our days. But we can, we can learn from the example of those who have gone before us. And as I thought these past few days about Paul's words to Timothy, I recall another letter written to a group of early Christians. This letter was written a short while after the close of the apostolic age. But before the third century began, a letter was written to a Christian named Diogenes, and he had much to teach us about living faithfully today. The letter includes these words. Christians are not differentiated from other people by country, language, or customs. You see, they don't live in cities of their own or speak some strange dialect or have some peculiar lifestyle. And the teaching of theirs has not been contrived by the invention and speculation of inquisitive men, nor are they propagating or preaching a mere human teaching as other people do. They live in both Greek and foreign cities wherever chance has placed them. They follow social customs in clothing, food, and other aspects in life. But at the same time, they demonstrate to us the wonderful and certainly unusual form of their citizenship. They live in their own native lands, but as aliens. As citizens, they share all things with others, but like aliens, they suffer all things. Every foreign country to them is as their native land, and every native country as a foreign land. They marry and have children just like everyone else, but they do not kill unwanted babies. They offer a shared table, but not a shared bed. They are present in the flesh, but they don't live according to the flesh. They are passing their days on earth, but are citizens of heaven. They obey the appointed laws and go beyond the laws in their own lives. They love everyone, but are persecuted by all. They are unknown and condemned. They are put to death and gain life. They are poor and yet make many rich. They are short of everything and yet have plenty of all things. They are dishonored and yet gain glory through dishonor. Their names are blackened, yet they are cleared. They are mocked, but they bless in return. They are treated outrageously, but behave respectively to, respectfully to others. And when they do good, they're punished as evildoers. And when punished, they rejoice as if they were given life. They're attacked by Jews as aliens. They're persecuted by Greeks. Yet those who hate them cannot give any reason for their hostility. To put it simply, the soul is to the body as Christians are to the world. The soul is spread throughout all parts of the body and Christians throughout all the cities of the world. The soul is in the body, but it is not of the body. So Christians are in the world, but they are not of the world.
Well, I began talking about prayer. Our epistle lesson this morning is all about prayer. So it's time that we pray. I close with this prayer. O God, from whom come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works, give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give, that our hearts may be set free to obey your commands, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
in our prayers this morning, we will be including a petition for Megan Small as she recovers from COVID. We also want to remember Heidi Schumacher's mother, Darlene Rangstorf. She's recovering from a fall and a broken hip. And then speaking of uh, hip surgery, John Kelsey, or as I like to call him, Big John, is also recovering from a hip replacement surgery. So let us call upon the Lord our God, the maker of heaven and earth. I invite you to kneel as you're able. O oh Lord, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of all living things. How can we begin to thank you? Accept our worship and praise, God of grace. O oh Lord, deliver us from selfishness and greed, and help us to share with those in need that all might have their daily bread. God of grace, O oh Lord, guide the rulers of nations and institutions to seek the common good, especially for those who are vulnerable and weak. God of grace, O oh Lord, come to the aid of those afflicted by warfare, crime, and injustice. God of grace, O oh Lord, we live in a wicked day and age. Bless those who faithfully serve in our military and in law enforcement to defend and protect us. God of grace, O oh Lord, help us not to grow weary in doing good as we trust your word that we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. God of grace, O oh Lord, comfort the dying, the sick, including Megan, darling, John, and the injured. God of grace, O oh Lord, hear and answer us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. With them we offer ourselves to your service and dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made for the sake of him who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ our Lord. To the Lord our God. It is indeed right and salutary that we should at all times and in all places offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave 
and by his glorious resurrection open to us the way of everlasting life. And so with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. For you have had mercy on us and given your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. We give you the thanks for the redemption you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Grant us your Holy Spirit, that we may take the eat and drink the fruits of his cross, and receive the blessings of forgiveness, life, and salvation that come to us in his body and blood. Hear us as we pray in his name and as he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to the disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them to drink, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament of my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Come to the banquet, for all is now ready. Amen.
joy, knowing that all your sins have been forgiven. And God loves you. Our service continues on the middle of page 18 with our post-communion prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, you gave your Son both as a sacrifice for sin and a model of the godly life. Enable us to receive him always with thanksgiving and to conform our lives to his through the same Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Receive the benediction of the Lord. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Take one more opportunity to thank Kathy so much for filling in for us on very short notice. I don't think a round of applause would be out of order to express your opinion. You're definitely going on my list. It's a good list. So you're going, you're going to be piled right there at the top if we need to, if should need ever arise again. Thank you so much. Well, go in peace and serve the Lord.